Without further ado, I welcome all of you and introduce to you Miss Naomi Gaines Young. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Rashida, for that um, wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here. Thank you um, to Miss uh, Professor Winston for inviting me and um, to speak here today. I feel tremendously honored to be amongst the circle of everyone who's here to speak. I'm really excited to hear people's stories and insights on um, the struggles within the system um, that caused this uh, conference to even be necessary. Um, so today, my presentation is called The Myth of the Strong Black Woman, um, How the Perceptions of Black Women Prevent um, Decent and Humane Treatment, Mental and Physical Health Treatment. So what I like to do um, is the format that I like to use um, let's see. So the format that I like to use, I like to start off with an intro. Um, in case you haven't heard this artist, his name is Self the Artist, and he basically speaks to the synopsis of what my interview or what this presentation is. The most disrespected Can everybody here in America is a black woman. Black woman. The most unprotected one, a person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. We will kill you for our woman. We stand up like men and place the same penalty over the head of anyone who puts his filthy hands out to put in the direction of our women. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Drive with me. Mm. Uh huh. Gotta let it breathe for a minute. Can't just jump into something like this. You know what I mean? It gotta sink in. On me. We all got mamas, sisters. Yeah. I gotta thank a black woman for all she done been through, been through, for all she done done, for giving us life, life, for raising our daughters, daughters, for training our sons. Thank a black woman, woman for supporting our dreams. And accepting our issues. We done drove through the mud. mud. We done fed up plenty. plenty. And she still stuck with you. Stuck with Thank a black woman. Black woman. For all she done been through. been through. For all she done done. For giving us life. life. For raising our daughters. daughters. For training our sons. Thank, Thank a black woman. Black woman. woman. For supporting our dreams. Black and accepting our issues. Black we done drove through the mud. mud. We done fed up plenty. plenty. And she still stuck, stuck with you. Thank a black woman. Black woman. I gotta thank my sisters, better yet my queens Scratch that, my blessed black man's first love Most valuable teachers, giving life long less She been underestimated and underappreciated since the day that she was born Of course she's stressed, only she can birth kings and nurture his dreams <laughs> We should buy in her presence, she deserve better She deserve to be loved, she deserve our respect Even when the world don't find the national guard can deploy She a must to protect, touch my queen and I'ma kill you about that And that's a black man, promise you can take it as a threat Cause we gon' give you Everything loaded in these hundred round drums we been buying up. That's a bitch. She my Angela Davis, my Coretta Scott King, my Harriet Tubb, my Fannie Lou Hammer, Claudia Jones, True from Sojourn, Josephine Ruff, my Ida B. Wells, beautiful my Wiley with brutally honest discussion. We gotta do better by one another. And the way you can do that today is thank a black woman. Mm -hmm. I gotta thank a black woman for all she done been through, been through for all she done done, for giving us life, life, for raising our daughters, daughters, for training our sons. Thank a black woman, woman for supporting our dreams and accepting our issues. We done drove through the mud, mud, we done fed up plenty, plenty, and she still stuck with you. Thank a black woman. Okay, can everyone still hear? Her? Hello. Can I hear? You. We can hear you. Okay, great. I just wanted to play that for a couple of reasons. One, mainly because the quote from Malcolm X in the beginning basically gave me the idea to do this presentation and why it's important to kind of demonstrate and show and present the, the, the history and the message behind what both Malcolm X and Self the Artist were saying. And also I played it because there's often this narrative that in the hip hop community that, um, 
black male rappers are misogynist, they're violent, uh, they only talk about, they put down the black woman. And I just want to just play that song to basically debunk that myth as well. And the format that I like to use um, is called the intro icebreaker in five paper. First, in introducing myself and the content I plan to go over. Rashida did an excellent job of introducing me. And the icebreaker is something that I use often a poem or a song. And finally, the fly paper is to help my audience stick to me, focus on the information being presented to be fully engaged and thus sticking to me as one does to fly paper. So if you're wondering why this topic of Black women needs to be discussed, it's quite simple, to find something lost. When we lose our keys, our wallet, or our phone, one of the first things that we do is go back to where we last seen the item and thoroughly check that area to hopefully recover what was lost. Likewise, tapping into our ancestral memory of what we lost. Our family is broken, you guys. And I'm referring to the human family right now. As a Black woman is the mother of the human family, we must start this quest to find our lost keys by going back to the beginning of when, how, and why we have created the myth of the strong black woman. So when I say that now black women, I'm not saying they aren't strong, no doubt we are strong. However, when we don't help or uh, give treatment or even administer compassion for black women because they are so strong, this is the, the myth that I speak of. So anyway, Again, emphasizing what Malcolm X says, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And here's the, the point of this presentation. Because the black woman is the most oppressed person, the saying of a rising tide lifts all boats could not be truer in this case. If you liberate the most oppressed group of people, then all will rise based on pure fact that if they're on the bottom and they rise and everyone that is above them rises as well, probably even quicker than the person on the bottom rising. So here's the information I plan to go over in this presentation. One, show the historic trauma suffered by Black women during slavery that gave birth to this myth. Present the theory that the destruction of the Black family in the 1970s was socially engineered and further lowered the static of the Black woman and the socioeconomic and political status of the Black man. Then how we can begin to challenge the notion that Black women are strong, thus needing or requiring less compassion, assistance, and or physical or mental health care. And finally, we will begin to debunk the myth of the strong black woman. So part one is going black in time. How the myth of the strong black woman began and further, you know, just giving you insight onto that. So historically there have been two main archetypes of the black women that have been born out of American chattel slavery. One, the mammy and two, the sex object AKA Bedwinch. So the mammy is usually the heavy set, smiling, happy to serve and work for Massa. She will take care of everything and everyone. She's the cook, the midwife, the medicine woman, the wet nurse, and the house lead. She was usually in charge of controlling the other slaves, even the men. And she remained loyal and joyful while doing it. Examples that you may be able to relate to is the character in Gone with the Wind, who's pictured here, and Ain't Your Mama. So then you have the sex object, the bed witch. She's usually vivacious, highly sexual. And the myth is that she enjoys sexual encounters with men. And I use the term encounters loosely because these encounters, well, let's just call it what it is, was rape. And she's usually a breeder and sold as auction as the ability to do so. That was one of the pitch, sales pitch. She's a good breeder. Her body parts were desired and they also were the source of fetishes. 
Examples of such women were women like Sarah Bartman. So who was Sarah Bartman? Sarah Bartman was the first black woman in America to be publicly and massively sex trafficked. While you may not know her name, I'm sure you'll recognize her body. Her more famous name was Hot and Tot Venus. For most of her love young life, she was passed around from men to men and publicly poked, prodded, examined, and placed on display even after her death. It has been said she died from infections left untreated due to being raped and passed around so much. She died in 1815 and her body remained on display in Paris until as late as 1974. Due to Sarah's frame and being sexually desired or at least popularized by her unique anatomy, dresses were fashioned to replicate her physique. The Victorian dress was inspired by Sarah Bartman's body. The dresses, um, the one on the left, you notice that the rear is raised and extended. It was even in the cartoon, Walt Disney's cartoon, Cinderella, the two wicked stepsisters are wearing the style of the Sarah Bartman dress, as well as the example on the right. So black women in slavery, birth, life, and death. So birth, now the black woman born into slavery, it was seen to be both a curse to be born female and slave. When of age to breed, she was seen as strong enough to be made to do so constantly, even forced to do so with her own immediate family members, if necessary, just as long as bodies were produced and made available for sale. She was looked upon as strong, so strong to work in the fields, in the house, in the stables, even while pregnant and up until the moment of birth, then giving birth and return, returning shortly thereafter to her duties as normal. Even the lovely Beyonce has a lyric in her song, the song Girls Run the World, strong enough to bear the children, then get back to business. Poor Beyonce not knowing how cruel the sentence within this context can be. Then after this pregnant woman gives birth, she's strong enough to be a wet nurse for Massa's new baby, while her own child was left neglected or received far less milk and sometimes just outwardly starved. But she's so strong, she can handle this, right? So life life for the black woman. So we established her strength. We've seen her room be made into a, a baby factory. So now let's test out medical instruments in the dawn of gynecological research and development. She doesn't need anesthesia, right? She's strong. She can handle the pain. In fact, she doesn't even feel pain like normal women. She'll do it with a smile and then make us pancakes afterwards because she's so strong. Now, death. Death, it would seem, would be a welcome respite from a life of trauma. With all she had to endure, wasn't death better? No. She had to keep going, even when tired, when she was tired from the soul, soul tired. But her children were the world to her. So for them, she had to survive. So she transformed her pain into song with stare, tears streaming down her face. She would hum because sometimes the pain is so great that no words could suffice. So she just get it out by humming. She gave birth to what we know today as gospel music. When Jesus says, my portion. She, but she was also intelligent. She learned to encode these lyrics so Harriet could gather others and guide them through the night. 
Follow the drinking goal. This is cold word for the Big Dipper, which points to the North Star, the way to freedom. So she's seeing her gospel and then cold the lyrics. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait. When escaping, travel through the shallow waters to throw the sin off your trail. She was strong because she found purpose in her pain and she used it to help others. Despite the trauma she suffered, despite her own inability to escape the clutches of slavery, despite being raped constantly, despite being raped, despite being down, beaten down psycho-spiritually, despite, despite, despite. If only we were all strong enough to do that. So I'm sure we've all heard the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress syndrome and have some general idea, if not extensive idea of what it means, even if only in layman's terms. Well, post-traumatic slave syndrome was developed by Dr. Joy DeGruy, and she wrote a book describing this diagnosis in much more detail. She defines post-traumatic slave syndrome as follows. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generational trauma resulting from centuries of slavery and continues to experience oppression and institutionalized racism. Added to this belief, either real or imagined, is that the benefits of the society in which, they're, in which they live are not accessible to them. This then is post-traumatically slave, slave syndrome. Now let's talk, let's put this on hold for a second and skip ahead to epigenetics, which is the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetics changes are reversible and do not change your DNA sequence, but it can change how your body reads a DNA sequence. What am I saying? I'm saying that this is the scientific response to those who often comment there's no connection today to the transgressions slavery perpetuated. There are no slaves now, nor slave owners existing today, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, except for private prisons in which existed in the past. It's over now, so stop talking about it, right? In order to understand the psychological residuals of slavery that we see today, you must first understand trauma and how trauma works. You must understand how behaviors and coping skills are passed down from generation to generation. And now I'm gonna give two examples of epigenetics. So um, going back to the diagnosis of PTSD uh, or PTSS, trauma first must be understood. Slavery, no doubt, was a traumatic experience for hundreds of years, and understanding the way trauma works is the only way one can begin to understand the psychological damage from slavery that still affects African Americans today. This lived trauma disrupted the way the mind was meant to function. The behaviors or coping skills used to survive this trauma was passed down not only directly from parent to offspring, but genetically and psycho-spiritually to future generations. These coping mechanisms used to survive then now has damaging effects today. These behaviors passed down to genetic code and psychological subconscious memory. Let me illustrate just two examples. The first being a scientific experiment, and the next is a social example. So I don't know if you heard of the epigenetic, epigenetic mice uh, study, a scientific example. So remember, epigenetics is the study of how one's behavior and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. So 
Carrie Ressler, a neurologist and psychiatrist and co-author of this study, became interested in epigenetic inheritance after working with people from the inner city, mostly African-American, who struggled with addiction, poverty, depression, and the like. And when Ressler noticed these issues seemed to appear in their children and even grandchildren, Ressler decided to conduct a scientific experiment. Ressler and his colleague, Brian Diaz, took mice and wafted the scent of acidophenone, a chemical of which smells of cherries and almonds. He wafted the smell into a chamber of mice. And when at the same time he wafted the spell, they simultaneously gave a small electric shock to the mice. What they discovered is that the mice began to shudder and expect the pain when they smell the acidophenone, even without an electric shock being administered. Now, what was most interesting about this study is that the same reaction was passed on to their offspring. The pups had never been exposed to the smell, yet shuddered with even greater intensity and anticipated pain and fear, even when they hadn't been previously exposed to the smell, and even when no electric shock was administered. Furthermore, the during generation of mice, the grandchildren, also inherited this reaction, as did the mice conceived through in vitro fertilization. Even with just the sperm of the males exposed to the smell of acidophenone, they had the same exact reaction. Intergenerational epigenetic trauma. Now, Dr. Jigori um, gave a tale of two mothers. So this is a social example of how uh, trauma can be passed down even today. So I spoke of her earlier and she gives a scenario about two mothers at a school sports game for their sons. One mother who happens to be black leans over to the mother who happens to be white and says, by the way, I just wanted to say that your son is doing very well. The white mother says, oh, thank you. He most certainly is. Did you hear he's in the chess club and he was just voted class president. His uncle is an astronaut, has been grooming him. The boy is brilliant. She is oozing with pride as she should be. And before the white mother sits back fully, she realizes that the black mother is actually excelling her son and says to the black mother, wait, wait, hold on. You're talking about my son. Your son is actually the one who's coming along. The black mother responds, oh, child, that boy is a handful. Girl, that boy is a mess. He works my nerves. Ooh. Now, the secret some of us know is that the Black mother is actually immensely proud. So why is she doing it? Why is she not accepting this compliment? Let's rewind time back during slavery. A young mother is standing near her young child in the field. And Massa walks up and says, oh, Maddie, is that your boy? Oh, he looks strong. He's really coming along, isn't he? Well, no, sir, he's shiftless and he's stupid. The boy ain't got good sense. She's doing this because she doesn't want Massa to sell him. If the child was a girl, she doesn't want him to breed her. This is maladaptive social behavior from living in a hostile environment. We never unlearn that. Just like we never learn to uh, pretend to care to pretend to where we didn't care for our lovers. The black man and the black woman had to pretend they didn't love each other so they wouldn't be sold away from each other because the love between them was a threat. Just like the love between family members on the same, same plantation was a threat. We had to hide affection from one another so our families wouldn't be perceived as a threat. So that love and that unity wouldn't be perceived as a threat to our owners. This struggle continues today. Black people unifying is the biggest threat to the dominant society. We pretended for so long not to care for each other. The black man and woman had to pretend for so long that they didn't love each other that today it has actually become our reality. So now let's go into part two of what I call the backlash, the black wash, 
and bearing the brunt of it all. So after the civil rights era was over, America was socially and politically exhausted. There were uh, the assassinations of Mega Evers, Malcolm X, both Kennedys and Martin Luther King. And this wore the establishment out. They realized that the issue was not just these leaders, but the economic empowerment of these leaders and figures that the black dollar will help to finance. And it helped to prepare these leaders, prepare, propel these leaders into the national international spotlight. But more importantly, the nightly news of the civil rights struggle being broadcast all over the world revealed America's hypocrisy overseas, especially when America claimed to be the land of freedom and claimed to be fighting for that same freedom for others in other countries and overseas. The decision was then made to deindustrialize the Black community. Up until 1970 one, uh, 1970, one could go to school and learn a trade and be ready for full-time employment right out of high school. My own high school in Chicago was once a vocational high school. You could graduate from high school and be a licensed electrician, plumber, carpenter, mechanic, and the like. You could earn a decent living right out of high school, sidestepping college. And then like clockwork, the fam factories in the um, inner city started to close and move out. That's why if you see photos of the black communities like from the 80s and late 70s, there are so many abandoned buildings and factories like here on this slide here. So in a matter of a couple of years, there were little or no jobs for black men to earn a comfortable living and support their families. So it already has been proven that the CIA flooded the black community with crack and then announced the subsequent war on drugs in the 80s. This was the perfect storm of the factories closing. There were no more journeyman trades in high school to provide anyone, especially black men with the skills needed to obtain employment to support their families. So what choice at this point does one have? The movie Kill the Messenger, oh, okay. The movie Kill the Messenger gives a good example or tells the true story of a journalist who broke this story about the CIA's conspiracy with crack and their war in Nicaragua to finance their illegal war and um, to arm the Contras. So it creates an either or opportunity to earn a living, especially for black men. And this was the beginning of the end of the black family. So Dr. Claw Anderson is the author of Powernomics and he talks about the three ways to earn a living. Now this is, for anybody living in this country, these are the three ways. And I'm not talking about inheritance or if your family left you a trust fund or I'm not talking about, I'm talking about if you earn a living. So the first way to earn a living, of course, is to have a job or a business, right? If that's not available, you go down to the second way, which is government assistance to provide for needs. That's only if you qualify and programs are available. So some kind of government benefit or assistance. If none of those two top ways work, the third level is crime, stealing, robbing, selling drugs. And this is the reality for everyone in America. This is the reality for anyone, regardless of race. If you don't fall into those first two, those first two areas, then crime is usually the third one, right? So now the black man is economically castrated, miseducated. Remember, no trades, no factory jobs, but here's this thing called crack that provides money and fast money at that. You get sell drugs if you're not killed then, or if you're not using it, that's another issue too. You go to jail for selling it and let's say you get out. So now you have the level of a felon which marginalized him even more. You can't get a loan. You can't get public housing, can't get student loans with a drug conviction. So the only choice left is to break the law again, go back to jail, and who is left to pick up the socioeconomic and political pieces? 
the Black woman. This brings me to the five indexes of Black progression or regression. So Dr. Umar, I got this from Dr. Umar who highlights the five headed, what he calls the five headed monster of black progression or regression, excuse me. Mass incarceration, miseducation, gentrification, lack of access to wealth and police genocide. Now let's look at the effect on the black woman for the, each of these five things. Again, mass incarceration, miseducation, gentrification, lack of access to wealth, and police genocide. So mass incarceration, loss of a mate, a partner, a parent, income, and support for the Black woman. Special ed, miseducation, special ed, the children, prison to school pipeline, and other types of various dysfunctional learning. Gentrification, lack of affordable housing, displacement, loss of community support and resources, family, friends, and places of worship, which also can help to provide some kind of fail safe for Black women, usually like um, churches support and like have free lunches or dinners or provide just basically that kind of community of, of, or community support and also uh, a base for her spirituality. Lack of access to wealth. Now, this is one, um, well, we have, people say, well, we have successful black people. There are black billionaires, black millionaires. Um, people are opening up their business. There's been an economic boom. People are uh, more financially better off. However, even with all of that in place today, if we were to stay at the current level that we are today with the black millionaires, black billionaires, black professionals, and uh, people who own their own business, even with all of that today, to stay in this uh, particular wealth place, we could not close the gap, the wealth gap between black and white, even in the next 100 years. Police genocide. Now, this is a loss on every level um, for the Black woman, the loss and the community, not just Black women, but the community and the children. There's loss of a potential mate, and you know all that comes along with I mean, having a supportive partner to help you support your family and raise your children. All right. So let's look at the statistics, shall we? And this is here in this country, this is in foreign. So black women are four to five times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. This is here, this is at present, this is current. Black infants are 3.8 times more likely to die from SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome than white infants. Black patients are 22% less likely to receive any pain medication than whites. I also was looking online at the statistic and doing some research and in which they said that first and second year medical students, white medical students have a notion or belief that black people and black women are more, have a higher threshold of pain. They can endure pain or they don't, they don't need pain medication as much because they have a natural, a natural, disposition to not feel pain. 34% of Black women in the U.S. are married compared to 67% of white women. I would argue that was because the lack of Black men to marry and mass incarceration and all those other factors that we talked about earlier prevent that from happening. Now, the one I want to speak on quite extensively is the last one. Less than 2% of mental health professionals are African American, so Black people are less likely to get competent cultural care than whites. I myself, as um, Rashida was so kind enough to illustrate, I have firsthand experience in this matter. If 
mental health has a stigma where people don't want to receive care out of fear of being called crazy or being seen as weak or some kind of uh, people associate mental illness with some kind of character flaw or weakness. It's even further compounded in the Black community where there's little to no dialogue about mental illness. There is little to no mass ed education or uh, information made available or that people, Black people maybe are willing or unable to receive. If one, if a Black person, if when I was going through my mental health crisis, which was quite extensively, if you break through the barrier to decide, you know what, I need some help. I know people around me are saying I'm crazy. I know I'm going to be looked as crazy if I go get mental health treatment. If you muster up the courage to fight through all the barriers, the social and mental and psychological barriers there is before you even get to ask or seek help. And you break through all of that and say, I'm going to make an appointment. I'm going to see a mental health professional. And then you do all of that. You get to the office and you're sitting across from someone who has no clue about your culture, no clue about that disparaging uh, information out there available to your community about mental illness and have no clue of what you go through, you're less likely to return for mental health treatment or receive effective and competent mental health treatment. I speak personally to this disparaging statistic that is actually very, very, very personal to me and very real. So often, Often I was met with, oh, you're strong. You're a strong black woman. You can do this. You got this. When trying to reach out just to my family members for help, not even talking about the professionals that I spoke of earlier, but I'm talking about just in my immediate circle. If someone thinks or feels you can carry anything burdensome, they are less likely to assist, offer support, or even allow an individual the privilege of a break. And this is especially true for people who directly interact with that individual, with seeing them struggle. They feel like they can handle it. They've handled the similar situations before and everybody's dependent on them. So we know that they can do this. They got this. So look, let's look at the contemporary images of Black women and help to foster this notion of Black women like they did during slavery. The mammy and the sex object remix, the image of Black women in today's mainstream media. So here's the mammy remix. This is the mammy roles that often we see that still exist today. I'm sure everyone sings the Popeye's commercial, everyone sings these pie saw commercial, and everyone knows who Medea is, unfortunately, but, and also Big Mama, as played by Martin Lawrence in Big Mama's House. So the sex object remits today. The beautiful ladies, not to say these ladies aren't talented, not to say these ladies aren't beautiful, and not to say that they're even aware of the history that you just guys just went through. Rihanna and the popular show that what we call the sex object and bed wrench scandal, the popular show. Sometimes the sex object is both mammy and sex object, like Lizzo. And now there's a new narrative of the angry black woman. If gangster rap and mainstream map music has done a wonderful job at tarnishing and criminalizing the image of black men, then Jerry Springer and reality shows have done an excellent job of doing so for the black woman. So now on the part, final part of my presentation, part three, 
contemporary catharsis, debunking the myth of the strong black woman. So we form our identities according to my studies in sociology when I was studying sociology at Metro State. So in the center, there's E, and this is individual. This is not uh, only for race or anything like that. This is just people in groups, any group. So you're at the center of the group that you belong to, whatever ethnicity or people you come from, you are in the center of that group. And your identity is formed first and not any particular order. It's first is how I see the group that I'm in. Next is how others see the group themselves. Then is how others in the group see me. And then last but not least, the identity is formed is how others outside the group sees me and the group. What am I saying? I'm saying these identities are very hard and hard to combat, hard to understand, hard to see when you're in the middle of it. When I went to, I remember a memory when I was in kindergarten, I was in fifth grade, and that was the year that they first had made Martin Luther King, they celebrated his birthday a law. And it was the Stevie Wonder song, happy birthday to you. People were celebrating. And in fifth grade, I learned the story of Martin Luther King. And what else I also learned at that time that I didn't know before that point is that I was inferior because I was black. Martin Luther King was killed working for people and trying to help people who look like me. And people were mad at him for that and they hurt him. And that must mean, because I look like that, that people want to hurt me. I'm not safe and I'm not valued. How I see the group, how others see the group, in the group sees the group, how others in the group see me, and finally how others outside the group see me and the group I belong to. Now I want to talk about Black women as family matriarchs. And I put slash super women because that's what we're all, Black women, Black matriarchs are called upon to be. Now also, I call this role the big mama role, piggybacking off the mammy role. Now all Black women in their families are not matriarchs. But when someone is a matriarch, like myself, at the time before, my illness and before my incarceration, I was the family matriarch of my family. And what does that mean? That means you take care of your immediate family. If you, if they have a problem or an issue, if your, your brother needs somewhere to stay, him and his girlfriend are beefing, do you got a couch? I need a couple of dollars, Naomi, because I gotta, I, I, I'm, I'm a little broke. I gotta have bus fare to get to work. Naomi got it. Extended family, people come from out of town or want to visit, they usually stay at the matriarch's house, my house. You take care of close friends because everybody's depending on you and calling on you. So your close friend having issues with her boyfriend or husband, she's talking on the phone and you don't want to tell her you got to do something because she's crying and going through men trouble. So you talk to her. Then you have children your children, you know, as well as everything else. Okay. Then um, you have work. Everyone, you have to have some kind of income to support yourself and your family. Then you have a partner, your partner everything that comes along with that. And I put church because usually there's some kind of outside agency, something we volunteer at, or church can simply mean your spiritual relationship with your higher power. And finally, right at the top, you are on call as a family matriarch 24 seven for emergency situations. You are available. You are the first person people call. When they're in trouble, you are the first pe person people call when they trying to when they call something has happened, 
somebody died, they call you because they know everyone's connected to you and the information and the message will get out. One thing I didn't put up in here because um, I didn't really think about it till after I made this is that when it's a holiday, everyone comes to the family matriarch's house. There, if you look at this and all the responsibilities that you have, you're not allowed there is an unwritten rule that you are not allowed to break down. You are not allowed as a black woman to say I need help because everybody depends on you. You got to help everybody. And this 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 kind of martyrdom 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 is like if I feel if I let my family down, if I'm not here from everybody I'm not letting them down. I'm letting myself down because I'm letting them down. That's how deeply ingrained and how much responsibility is put on a family matriarch. And if you look at this circle of all that she's responsible for, I'm sure you find, you see one thing that's missing and that's herself. Who helps the helper? Who reaches out? to that family matriarch, where do they get their support from? So self-care, I remember reading this for the first time and breaking down into tears because no one tells us this. You are worth the quiet moment. You are worth the deeper breath. You are worth the time it takes to slow down, be still, and rest. If you read that to a matriarch in the midst of her stress, in the midst of her doing everything and feeling guilty because she can't be superwoman, she probably would break down and cry. I did when I read this because no one told me this and no one told me to slow down, be still, and rest was acceptable. And okay. So why? Why talk about this as a, at a multicultural conference? And it's quite simple. The Black mother is the mother of civilization. She is the root to every family member we have on this planet. And regardless to what anyone may say, there is only one race, and that's the human race. If we take care of these roots, if we nurture and feed these roots, the human race will always be healthy. We'll have problems, yes, but if we take care of these roots, the tree of the human family will be healthy, vibrant, and provide nourishment for our family, which is a human family. So how do you apply all this information that you learned today? By knowing that you are a universe. Everyone that is in the sound of my voice, everyone that can hear me, everyone that just has, has this information presented to them, you are powerful behind measure because there is a circle of people and places and organizations that revolve around you. And you have the power you have the ability to affect people that someone else may not be able to. You are in a circle that people that on somebody else may not be able to reach, but you can because we all have our own universe of family, friends, work, organization. Everyone can affect change in your own little small universe or big universe. The movie Avatar provides an excellent example to make the invisible visible. They had something when they greet people and say, I see you. And it's not just I'm looking at you physically with my eyes, I see you, which is another way I value you. You are important, I see you. The first thing they said was not hello. The first thing they said to each other is I see you. And so many Black women, because we do what we do and have the history that we have, and from being so strong, 
even with carrying so much, we remain invisible. And not just to professionals we deal with, but to our own family members, to our own friends. Just like I show you the chart of the matriarch, she remains invisible. And what may, remains invisible is her ability to have help, ability to be seen as someone who can rest and take a break, as seen as somebody that is okay not to be okay sometimes. It's okay. And it is not a weakness to ask for help. Let's help make that invisible, those invisible sentences, that invisible concern visible. It is the minimum, yet it is the maximum for Black women to truly be seen. I see, I understand you. Dr. Wayne Dyer, the late Dr. Wayne Dyer is one of my spiritual and uh, philosophical mentors. While in prison, I read almost every book he ever, he ever wrote. And he was a great inspiration to me. And he has a quote, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change. And I piggyback off that comment. And if you change the way you look at Black women, then the world you look at will change. And what is that world? It's the human family. Thank you all for listening and for having me.